Amen. For Christianity, this is the most important day of the year. When we focus on the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For us, this holds the cherished memories of what gave us true victory from sin and the grave and give us an opportunity to have an eternal relationship with God. Would you turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15? If you're using one of our Red Pew Bibles, you can turn to page 156 toward the back. I'll help you get there more quickly. It's a tremendous passage of Scripture and where Paul declares to the world and especially to the church of Corinth uh, the truth of the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. I find it really interesting that he's writing to Christians because in this passage of Scripture, where he goes, moreover, brethren, so as he's talking to the Christians, he then gives probably the most succinct and clearest de description or definition what the gospel is. And we'll look at that in just a little bit. And part of that gospel is the fact of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which many at that time were trying to deny the bodily resurrection of Christ. They were like the Sadducees during the time of the life of Christ, which would deny that there would be a bodily resurrection. Well, for Christianity, it became the emblem of their faith. It became what they discussed most. Uh, it became why it became, uh, worship became the part of the first day of the week and doing it on Sunday, starting off with the worship of our, our risen Savior. This is a day the Lord hath made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it, truly as a, a part of it, to deal with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So we rejoice in this day. This truly is what Christianity is about. The question that I would have with, for you is, would you consider yourself saved? There are several ways we describe Christianity or what it is to have a relationship with God. We may ask someone, are you saved? What we are talking about when we ask that question, and we will get in further into our message later, is we're asking, has there ever been a point in time in your life that you have been delivered from your sins, saved from your sins, and been given a new life in Jesus Christ? It might be called born again. So might ask, someone might ask you, are you born again? And the question is asking, has there ever been that point in time where you have trusted Jesus Christ as Savior? Same thing. In John chapter 3, Nicodemus, you must be born again. You're born physically, now you have to be born spiritually. You have to have this new life in Christ. Or we might refer to the term as Christian. Are you a Christian? The idea is, are you one that is walking in the truths of Jesus Christ the Lord? So today I want to talk to you about what is the gospel. And look at that from the portion of scripture that I've chosen for you today. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, but let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear Father, as we come to you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, truly we have sung some of the most dynamic songs in our hymnal, especially when it comes to the resurrection. And then the truth very well sung, it's the fact that for me he died. Every one of us could impersonalize that. Every one of us could recognize, stop and recognize that he has died for every one of us as an individual. The question is, what have we done with Christ? Has there been that time where we have trusted in Jesus Christ alone for salvation? Or are we basing our salvation or our desire to go to heaven one day on the works which we have done instead of the work that he has done? So guide us in our study of your word. May everything spoken today be a truth based upon your word. And may we truly then follow up any opportunity we have to impact a soul for Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. First of all, I want us to look at the opening two verses of 1 Corinthians chapter 15 where I have simply a point of the message is this, a believer and how to become one. Because that's one of the most important things in this life is to understand how can I become a believer? What is it to be a believer and how can I become one? Look here in the opening verse here, 
where it says, Moreover, brother, and again speaking to these Christians at the church of Corinth, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye received, and wherein ye stand. And so there's some important truths here that Paul is delivering in this brief letter as he writes. He says, this is a message that I've already declared unto you, this gospel message. Now, we'll talk a little bit later about what that includes in the gospel. But he says, I, I delivered a gospel message. I preached it to you. I declared it to you. And he said, and ye received it, and, and wherein ye stand. And, and so they did something with that preaching. And in fact, I hope everyone would stop and consider doing something with the preaching of God's word today. You might say, well, I'm already a Christian, I'm already a believer. Then what you do is worship the Lord because of that. You glorify God because of that. You praise the Lord and thank the Lord for the salvation that he has already provided for you. But if you recognize in your life, I don't know that I've ever done anything with this, this gospel message, then this is an opportunity for you to do something. He says, for you... As a church of Corinth, ye received it. Now, that's similar wording to what we studied just the other week in our series that we're in, in the book of 1 Thessalonians. And twice in chapter 2, in the same verse, he talks about ye received this message. And the first word meant to, to listen. You, you, you opened your heart. You're willing to listen to the message of the gospel that I had for you. But then the second word received was then you took hold of it. You, you didn't just listen to it, you, you grasp hold of it, and that's the same word used here. So these people that he, are, he is writing to, they're Christians, and the reason they're Christians is when Paul preached to them the gospel, they took hold of that. They, they identified that was something that they needed in their own life, and, and they received that message, and wherein you stand, their, their lives were now based upon that gospel message and the fact that they became a child of God. They became a Christian. Then he goes on in verse number two where he says, by which also ye are saved. So this, remember I said, are ye saved? Well, he says, well, you're saved. Well, how does Paul know someone's saved? Well, no one knows anyone's heart, but in their belief of the scripture and in their receiving of the word and their continuing to stand, they were bearing evidence by their life that they were truly born again, that they were truly saved. He says, if you keep in memory that which I preached unto you, unless you believed in vain. There's been this message in theology, and sometimes you'll hear this discussed in theological terms, that you should never say you ought to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And the idea proposed that you don't receive him, he receives you. But I do believe there is some evidence within Scripture that we can truly and rightly and biblically say we have received him. In fact, he says in verse number one, ye received this message, and then in verse number two, ye believed. So it's really saying the idea of receiving Jesus Christ is the same as believing on Jesus Christ, trusting in Jesus Christ for salvation. So when I received Christ as my Savior is when I believed on him for salvation. Now for me, I believe it was as a five-year-old sitting in the front of a Sunday school class because the teacher told me that's where I had to sit. Uh, I was quite a uh, troublesome little boy. And uh, they, the word that, that lingers to this day was brat. Uh, whatever that means, they've called me a brat. They'll see me 30 years later. Ah, you are quite a brat. I don't know that I'm any different today. Uh, I still might be a brat. But I was sitting, I know, front row, I know, because the teacher made me sit there. But I truly, for the first time, understood my need of salvation and believed on Jesus Christ to save me from my sins. And so I don't think there's a wrong in, in using the word received because it's likened here, uh, he came unto his own and his own received him not, but as many as received him. Again, the scriptures use it. So when we believe, that means we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ to save us from our sins. Now, there's a huge difference between believing in something and believing on someone. 
you might believe there is a God. James says uh, in James chapter 2, thou believest there is one God. That's, that's commendable. Thou doest well, in fact, he says. But he goes on to say this, the devils believe also and tremble. So merely believing there is a God is not enough to get you into heaven. Because even devils believe that there is a God. So what's the difference between, and this is a good question to ask, what's the difference then between a Christian and a devil? You say, well, I know some that live like one. Well, that's a different sermon. We'll talk about that in another week. But, but the reality of it, the, a devil has never placed his trust in Jesus Christ. He believes there's a God, but he has never trusted in Jesus Christ to forgive him of his sins. And isn't it a wonderful truth to know that when you got saved, he has already forgiven you of every sin, past, present, and future. As a Christian, if there's something you do against the Lord today, it's already forgiven. I think as Christians, to keep that relationship, we confess our sins, and he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. But the reality of it is, once I have trusted in Jesus Christ as Savior, I am ongoing forgiven of every sin that I ever commit against the Lord. So this is the idea here, then. There is a difference between simply believing there is a God and trusting or relying in him. Some of our guys recently drove to Florida. That's quite crazy, Brother George, to drive to Florida. Uh, some of you might say, you know, are you taking the car? You say, well, I believe it will get me there. Uh, but because we're not sure of the validity of the car, you say, but I don't want to waste a week's of good vacation, so I'm going to rent a car instead. And the reality of it is you think it will get you there, but you're not willing to put your trust in that vehicle to get you there. You're looking for something else to get you there. Well, the same is true about Christianity. There are some that believe there is a God, but they've never put their faith in trust in Jesus Christ to save them from their sins. The reality of it is we must all recognize that it's not by works of even righteousness which we have done. But it's according to his mercy that he saved us. It's not of works lest any man should boast, as scripture says. I was stopping and meditating about that this week. What, what work could I do that would so impress God that he would allow me to live in heaven for all eternity? I mean, what work? You, you say, well, well I, I help my neighbor with his mowing, and I, I help my neighbor with her shoveling. Do you really think that that would be equated in, or I help my neighbor with this task, so I'm going to give you eternal life in heaven because you are a good person? You see how weak that sounds? It really sounds foolish to think that I'll be given, granted heaven, because I've done some good things for people. Now, it, is it a good thing to do good things for people? Correct, it is. In fact, it says in, then later on in Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Now that we become a Christian, we ought to maybe help the, the neighbor with mowing the yard or, or our neighbor lady that's elderly with shoveling the, the sidewalk or whatever it may be. We ought to look for opportunities to do good, but to believe that that doing good is actually going to allow me to receive the, the eternal reward of heaven really is a foolish idea especially when God's word, and that's what we've got to base it on, right? I mean, we can't base it on just what we've heard other people say. I mean, again, I've used this over the years, but you know, some, some people say everybody gets to heaven. Some people say only those that do good works get to heaven and, and so forth. There's a lot of different arguments of how to get to heaven. or They can't all be true. Do you really believe everyone will end up in heaven? 
Do you really believe it's based on, on just doing some polite things to people that will get you there? And so he says it came through a message, a message called the gospel, where each one of us recognize that for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Our ultimate goal is to glorify God with our lives. And because of our sin nature, we've fallen short of that. Well, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. We're going to read that in just a minute. Christ died for us according to the scriptures. And when we trust that Jesus Christ's death what was for us so that he could set aside and forgive us of our sins and trusting in only Jesus Christ through Jesus Christ can I get to heaven. So when we get saved, we have to first of all stop and recognize I can't get there on my own. And then we can fully recognize I can only get there through Jesus Christ the Lord. So it really boils down. It's a really simple message. That's why some of our tracks in the past have just simply been called God's simple plan. Because it's really a simple message that God has sent his son to die on the cross of Calvary for the sins of the world. And anyone who wants to enter into that personal one-on-one relationship with God will also then receive an eternity in heaven with God. So you enter into that relationship which allows you to glorify him with your life. He forgives you of your sins, past, present, and future. And you enter into that special bond and relationship with him. He is our father. You can call him father, and we are his children, sons and daughters of God. And so Paul just describes it this way. He says, hey, brother, and this is, this is how you got into the family. You received, you believed, this is where you stand, this is how you got saved. So a believer and how to become one, it's simply by trusting in Jesus Christ for salvation, believing that he has died for your sins, but then also believing that he rose again to give you life because his death ultimately gives you life. So let's look at the second part of the message. Let's go on then to verses 3 and 4 of this passage of Scripture. He says, and here I I just simply have it. It's the gospel and and what it includes for you. So a believer now to become one, then the gospel and what it includes for you. And and dear friend, if it's the first time you've visited here, it is very rare for me to just stop and preach an entire message just on the gospel. Week after week, 95% of the time, I'm preaching to Christians and including the gospel somewhere within the message. But I believe as we get together as Christians, we need to be strengthened by the preaching of the word. And and so almost all my messages are, are really pinpointed for helping a Christian to grow in Jesus Christ and in that, uh, sharing a thread of the gospel. But today, uh, because of the opportunity with Easter and just rejoicing in the resurrection of the Lord, and then in a couple weeks that we have communion, I'm really going to focus on some gospel messages because this is the opportunity to declare the gospel. We can't assume anyone is a believer and on their way to heaven, and we want to continually preach that message here and throughout. So the gospel, and what it includes for you, and let's look beginning in verse number one again. This is, this is a gospel. I declared unto you the gospel. Well, what's the gospel? If you break it about down by definition, it simply means good news. Or it means an announcement of something that is good. Or even an announcement of a reward. And that's been used throughout scripture. Seventy-seven times, I believe it was, that I saw that this word was used in the New Testament. Every time the word gospel or one of its affiliate words were used in the New Testament, every time it is speaking about salvation. Is speaking about entering into a relationship with Jesus Christ. So this is the good news. This is the center piece of Christianity for us. To talk about Jesus Christ and what he has done for you. But now he's going to explain what is in that message. Look beginning in verse number 3. For I delivered unto you first of all that which ye received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, 
and that he was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So first of all, I simply want to say this. First of all, the gospel is Bible. Meaning, this is a message that came right out of the Bible. This is a message that came out of God's Word. This is something Paul said, I received, and how did I get it? I got it right from the Scriptures. In fact, if you're ever looking for a church, or you're ever seeking to get involved in a church, seek for a church that's still preaching the Word of God. A church that's basing its messages, its theology, its practices on the Word of God. Don't, don't just seek... For a church that's going to present you some positive message to encourage you. I, I hope messages are em- encouraging. I hope messages are positive. But what we want is the truth from God's word. And Paul says, you know what? What, I re- what I'm going to give to you is what I received. And how did I receive it? I received it from God through his word. So when, when we talk about the gospel, we are talking about something that is Bible. This is Bible Based. This is right out of the scriptures. But then he says there's three parts to it here in this passage of scripture. And I want you to notice that. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which also I received, how that Christ died for our sins. I've already begun to talk about that in this message. I just couldn't leave it off. When you're talking about a believer and how to become one, you, you can't just skip over that. And so he says, Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. Christ didn't die because he was a sinner. He had lived the perfect life. For me, he died. They just sung to us. Every one of us, individually, in fact, let's do that collectively. Let's say, for me, he died. Can you say that together? For me, he died. Think about that. He died for you. It wasn't that he died for a class of people. It wasn't that he died just for the Jews, because he was Jew. He died for every one of us. And he died not because we were such great people. You know, I look at Pastor Terry down here. What a great guy. Man, who wouldn't give their life for Pastor Terry? He's a great guy. In fact, that's what Romans says, doesn't it, in the 8th chapter? Even for a good man, will some dare to die? I'm not sure I will for him, but anyway, somebody would. No, I I would. I I definitely would give my life for him. Uh, Because of our friendship over the years and our service together and and his focus on serving the Lord, I give my life for him. But while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. What an amazing. Incredible truth. Next year, if you come back on Easter, I'm going to be preaching on that two-part idea. Uh, You say, next year? Yeah, I've already got it. Uh, These are laid out years ahead. Man, God lays a message on my heart, and I just start working on it. And sometimes two, three, four years. I preached a message the other week. I started 12 years ago. Anyway, uh, but I'm preaching on those two most Uh, important aspects of of salvation, and that is one, the love that he has for us. And the other is the power that he can raise us from the dead. But the love that God has for us, that he would send his son to die for us. And he says, I died, Christ says, I died for you while you were yet a sinner. But it's more than that. He says in verse number four, and that he was buried. Have you ever stopped and considered this idea, that borrowed tomb? Why why did he only have a borrowed tomb? Well, he didn't need it very long. He was only in that tomb for three days and three nights, and he would be raised up together. In fact, it's going to mention that here in the end part of the verse, but I don't want to get there yet. And so when, when you consider that tomb, that's a place where his body laid. He died and he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Uh, For some of you, uh, uh, your phone is is quite the museum piece. I was talking to someone the other day and they're flipping through and they're just, you know, trying to find a picture for me. And I what in the world do you have? He said, well, I've got over 7,000 pictures on here. I looked at my phone, I have 23. (laughs) 
Uh, I am not a keeper of pictures. And in fact, Karen and I went to a wedding a couple years ago, beautiful lake uh, up near New York or whatever, wherever it was, and beautiful lake. I took a picture of her because she's beautiful. She took a picture of me because she felt guilty for not having a picture of me, I guess. And no. <laughs> And she took my camera and took a picture of me. We get home and she says, hey, send me that picture I took of you today. I said, I already deleted it. <laughs> I didn't need it on there. I didn't, I, I didn't think about her asking me for it. Uh, in fact, if you look at my phone, I have a couple of pictures of my family. And, and then the rest are serial numbers from my mower and snowblower and all that so I can get parts when I'm away. Uh, that's my pictures on my phone. And I, I, have a, I think it was 23 on there the other day. Uh, but you know, the two, two of them I have on there is when Karen and I went to Israel. And they took, out, took us to where they believe is where Christ was buried. And what a beautiful garden. You step down into this garden. And there's where uh, the opening is. And there, there's a door, now a wooden door there to protect from the elements. And it says, he is risen. You go in there and in the partitions, if you'd understand, read the scriptures and understand the scriptures and study the history of how they do it, they, they, they would be partitions actually within a tomb. And they took us in there and showed us right where it is believed that Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior, was buried. That's two of my 23 pictures. I deleted every other picture from Israel. I have them somewhere maybe, but I'm just not into keeping all that. But I couldn't delete those two. And from time to time, I just go back and look at those two pictures and think about what Christ did for me. Jesus Christ died and was buried and then he rose again, according to the scriptures. And you say, well, what's the importance of that? Well, he is the first. Well, in fact, let's look at that. Let's look at right here in this passage. Drop down to verse 20, I think. But now is Christ risen from the dead. And he's giving a defense of the resurrection of Christ. And he throws it out there. What if he wasn't risen and how your religion is vain and so forth? But, but now is he risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept? A, a reference to believers who have passed, they're referenced to as just sleeping. Why? Because it's just a temporary. And, and he goes on in verse number, the end of verse number 22, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. And look at the end of verse number 23. Afterward, they that are Christ uh, at his coming, we're going to be resurrected, they that are Christ. Think about it as a Christian. As a Christian, the scripture says you actually never die. In fact, he asks this question, believest thou this? Do you believe that after becoming a child of God, you will actually never die? And you say, wait a second, so-and-so, I know they were a Christian and they died. Well, let's, let's understand really what happened. Really what happened, according to James, is their spirit was separated from their body and so when their spirit went into the presence of the Lord, the body died. That, that physical representation of who they were, they never died. Isn't that a wonderful truth for us who've lost a loved one, you've lost a, a spouse, you've lost a grandparent, you've lost a child, you've lost a grandchild, whoever it may have been, and, and you say, wow, because they're a believer, they actually never died. They actually just passed from that body into a body not made with hands, eternal in the heavens, the scripture says, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. What a tremendous truth. Folks, our hope is fixed on the truths of this holy book. And the truth is this, every one of us can become a believer by putting our trust in Jesus Christ alone for salvation. And in doing so, we receive him as our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. How is that possible? Because the gospel included you. Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. He was buried and rose again, according to the scriptures. Praise the Lord. 
that this day is about the salvation and the regeneration of mankind through the death, burial, and ultimately the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Believest thou this? Friend, are you Christian? Are you born again? Are you saved? They're all terms re- focusing on the same idea. We've come to the realization of our sinfulness and the need of a Savior and the realization that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. And we put our trust, our faith, our soul into that message and receive it and stand upon that promise of what Jesus Christ has done for us. If you haven't done that already, we welcome you to do so today. We'll have someone take the scriptures and show you how you can be born again, how you can become a Christian and get that peace that passes all understanding that if you were to pass even today that your body would your soul would merely go from the body into the presence of the Lord we have the truths of that all contained within the scriptures let's pray your friends with heads bowed and eyes closed i've tried to present a clear presentation of the gospel and what it is to become a christian how to believe and trust in Jesus Christ alone for salvation. And who of you would say with an upraised hand, Keith, as you preached this morning, I recognize I'm not really positive that I'm a Christian. I'm not not sure I'm on my way to heaven. And, And I want you to begin to pray for me. Please don't embarrass me. Please don't point out who I am. But would you begin to pray for me as I'm concerned? I want to go to heaven. I want to have a relationship with God. But I'm not sure I'm there yet. Will you pray for me with an upraised hand? He's saying, Keith, would you pray for me? And he won it all. And those of us who are in Christ Jesus, what an opportunity to rejoice today, to think of what Jesus Christ has done for us. How God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. How Jesus Christ so loved the world that he laid down his life. Dear Father, I come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and truly rejoice in salvation. That is by faith alone. Father, if anyone here is still under just a, a questioning belief that maybe they can earn their way there, maybe they can do enough good, I pray that you would shake that foundation by the scriptures. And Father, I pray that you would work in their hearts by the working of the Holy Spirit. God, would you please work in every one of our hearts, bring joy to the heart of the believer. All that thrills our soul is Jesus. Oh, Father, so often as Christians, we we even half-heartedly sometimes say amen or we half-heartedly sing a song. But may we sing a song with full joy in our hearts. May we truly worship you as on high. And we thank you for all that you've done for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Christy, what song?